Um, I want to welcome everybody to Saddleback Church, your campuses all over Southern California, around the world, and the two new campuses that you launched on Mars and the Sun. Um, welcome. There are lost people there as well. Um, I'm so happy to be with you guys. I want to thank Pastor Rick and Kay and it's the Saddleback family. I um, feel like it's home. My name was even on the microphone, so it's a good day. It's good. It's good. Um, I got some questions for us. And I'm going to say question for you, but I, I mean it for me as well. My first question is this. How many God-given dreams have you and I left unrealized because fear placed us in a prison that we could not escape from? Let me ask us another question. How many God accomplishments with your name written on them, with my name written on them, have gone unaccomplished because fear paralyzed us? By the way, if you're like 21, you'll be 43 my age, like really quick. <laughs> so think about that question. So here's the deal, if you and I continue, if you continue to live in fear, your family, your friends, your church, and the world will miss your unique contribution. Now let me say it a little bit more theologically and a little bit more strongly. You and I will rob God of his glory if we remain in fear, and I don't want to be a glory thief. Are you tired of living in fear? Now, let me talk to the men, okay? I know we're dudes. Some of you have hair on your back. <laughs> Used to be on your head. Um, and we're not supposed to act like we're not afraid. But the reality is, is that we are. I still at times feel like a sixth grader on the first day of school and I can't find my locker. How about you? And I think the sooner we admit that, the sooner God can do an epic work in our lives. When we do admit, I am afraid, and God, I need you. By the way, I love when my kids tell me they need me. I dropped my daughter off at college last week at Clemson. We've been texting, and today I heard her voice. I about cried in my hotel. I heard my baby's voice, and you know what? She needed me. Well, our Papa in heaven wants his people to say, Papa, I need you. He wants to hear our voice. Are you tired of being tired of being stuck in fear? Well, God wants to give us courage to face our fears. Would you pray with me? Let's pray. In the name of Jesus, Father, would you bless this message through the Holy Spirit's power and presence? Would we be transparent? Would we, would, would we be honest to say, God, here I am. Here's my situation. I need you. May we be courageous. And Jesus' people said, amen. All right, so God has an epic story. All of us live in a story. The key is we need to put our story in God's story. But God's story does not start in time and in space. God's story starts in eternity. So go back with me. I'm talking old school. Way, 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 way back before time, before space, before matter, before energy, before anything. There was only God, the triune God, Yahweh, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. One of the theological and philosophical questions is asked is, well, what was God doing when there was nothing? You know what God was doing? Being God, 1 John 4, 7, God is love. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit was in this epic love fest, enjoying one another. And God, by his own free will, decides to create a universe. God, by his own free will, decides to create this third rock from the sun called planet Earth. And on this planet would be his image bearers. 
That the same love that was happening in heaven would happen on earth. Those image bearers, Adam and Eve, they were to be statues, to be representations of God's grace to the world. Many of us know the story. Adam and Eve said, God, we don't want you to be God. We don't want you to be king. We want to be our own gods and kings. And when we did that, epic fail. Would you agree that our world is broken in need of repair? Now, we haven't got to this part of the sermon yet, but would you agree that you and I are in need of repair and that we're broken? So Adam and Eve break God's heart. But God, being the loving papa that he is, says my purposes and my plans to fill earth with my glory is not gonna be stopped by you. So God in his grace raises up Abraham. He makes a deal with Abraham called a covenant. Abraham, through you, I'm gonna bless all of the ethnos, all of the nations, all of the people will be blessed. Ultimately, that blessing is Jesus, the Jewish Messiah. But before then, Abraham had some kids, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob, these kids become this great nation called Israel. They struggle with God. That's what Israel means, to wrestle with God, to struggle with God. They say, God, we don't want you to be our king. We want a, a man to be our king. Eventually, that man is a man by the name of Saul. So let me pick us up in God's story, because if you and I don't live in God's story, we're going to have our own story, and that's not a good story. So where we get to is the children of Israel, led by King Saul, are going into the promised land, but there's a problem there. There's a group of people that are called the Philistines. And back in the day, the way wars worked were on one side of the mountain, you would have the nation of Israel. On the other side of the mountain, you'd have the Philistines. So it was like an ancient octagon. And so the Philistines would send out their champion, this dude by the name of Goliath. You've heard of Goliath, big, strong, nasty, a champion, undefeated. So whoever would fight him, and if they lost, they lost everything. So King Saul and Israel were like, somebody go fight him. And they were all like, dude, did you see, did, 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 did you see him? Did you see him? I'm not going to go. By the way, let me do a time out here. What's the Goliath in your life right now? Because we're not just having a Bible study. What's the Goliath in your life right now? Is it pornography? Is it addiction? Dysfunctional family, cutting. What is your Goliath that you're going, nah, <laughs> ah, my hamstring hurt today. <laughs> now, meanwhile, let me go back in time. God was gonna move past Saul because of his disobedience and he sends a prophet named Samuel to a man named Jesse's house. And he says, amongst Jesse's sons is the next king. Jesse has some very impressive sons. By the way, why do we always judge people by their outsides? Even right now, we judge success by what college someone attends or what job they have. How do we know they're success successful? They may be a jerkosaurus. <laughs> they may be rude and nasty. Oh, they're successful. Really? I've had the honor and privilege of holding people's hands as they transition from this life to the next. And not very many of them talk about all the stuff that they have collected. Talk about relationships. So anyway, the sons come up, they're big and handsome, and God says, no, that's not, that's not the king. You got another son, and then at this time, here comes David, 13-year-old. The Bible says he's ruddy, which means he had red hair. So he's a redhead Jewish kid. And he's been out with the sheep. So I don't know about you, but sheep stink, and sheep drop certain things along the way. So he probably didn't smell very good. God tells Samuel, that's the king. He anoints him with oil. So David is the future king. Now let's speed back up. The nation of Israel is afraid. They're quaking in their boots. They're afraid. Goliath is challenging them, taunting them. Jesse sends David to take his brother's lunch. So David gets on his camel with chrome hooves. He puts on his Dr. Dre Beats headphones. <laughs> okay, you get it. Stops at McDonald's, kosher of course. 
hits some Big Macs and he's going to see his brothers. And when he gets there, when David gets there, something happens. He sees the men of Israel afraid. He sees a Philistine taunting Israel and their God. Now, teenagers, I really want you to get this. David, the teenage boy, shows us how to be courageous enough to face our fears. So how do we become courageous enough to face our fears? Number one, love God's glory more than your fear. Love God's glory more than your fear. Let's look at 1 Samuel 17, 26. David asked the soldiers standing nearby, what will a man get for killing this Philistine and ending his defiance of Israel? Who is this pagan Philistine anyway that he is allowed to defy the armies of the living God? Now, teenagers, young adults, notice it's a young one, a youngling calling the others to action. Who is this defying the glory of God? Who is this? You see, we've got to love God's glory more than our fear. Um, I grew up as a compulsive stutterer. One of my greatest fears in life was talking in front of people. Because when you stutter, it doesn't go so well and people laugh at you. Got laughed at a lot. I had to go to a little special class for people who can talk real good and other kids knew and they'd walk by the class like, hey, hey, how you doing? See, y'all even laughing now. Yeah. Good thing I'm, my identity's in Christ, so I get all sensitive and everything. Okay, so, didn't want us to talk. I remember in 10th grade leaving a French class because I had to stand up and give an oral examination. I left the class. It was too painful. I didn't want to be laughed at. The teacher was very merciful and let me come in after class and everybody else left to give my message. In 1998, played one last year of professional football. Then in the fall of 1999, I was a brand new Christian and I was invited to go speak at a youth event. It's like former NFL player who loves Jesus, give him a microphone to speak. And I really wrestled with God. I said, God, why would you send me to go? I'm a compulsive stutterer. I'm a brand new Christian. Why would you send me to go? And all of the memories and, 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 and everybody making fun of me and I could see myself being on stage like stuttering and, and not knowing what to do and embarrassing myself again. And I was arguing with God. God, why would you do this? Why would you have them call me? Surely there's somebody better who can actually put words together. Why would you send me? I was afraid. I remember I was in the shower, just wrestling with God and praying to him. And a couple things happened, not an audible voice, but the first thing was this, Derwin, if I can raise my son Jesus from the dead, I can move your tongue to talk. And Derwin, I put something in you, a message of grace and I want you to unleash it, but you've got to trust me. Fear became a friend because it pushed me to my daddy. Let me say that again. Fear became a friend because it pushed me to my daddy. So when the enemy knocks on the door, I let Jesus answer it because he takes me to my daddy. How about you? Where does fear take you to? A bottle? Prescriptions? Yoga? <laughs> I hope it pushed you to your daddy. So I went down there and I preached and note cards have fallen out of my pocket and shared my story and at the end of it, a bunch of people came to Jesus. And God was like, see, I got this. And lo and behold, I'm at Saddleback Church. <laughs> now, thank you. What's your lo and behold moment that fear is right there, but you're paralyzed because you're afraid of your fear more than you love the glory of God? Maybe it's a broken marriage. 
And if you let people know that you're actually human and there's cracks and fractures in your life, it'll be okay. This is a great church. Tons of people here want to help you. But being afraid that people will actually know that you're human, that's why Jesus went to the cross, because he knows that we're broken. If you're hurting here today, we have a Savior who longs and loves to touch hurting people with his grace. Maybe it's an addiction. Maybe your wife keeps telling you, you know, sweetie, I think you got a problem. A bottle of wine every night is a problem. Maybe for some of you, you're coasting through life and not really challenging yourself because you're afraid to fail. Here, I got some really good news, okay? I got some really good news. Everybody lean forward, lean forward. Even if you like way over there across the ocean, just lean forward, lean forward, okay? All right, check this out. In God's providence, when his people fail, we fail forward. In other words, our failures become stepping stones. We fail forward. It's okay if you fail. When a sovereign God is your father, you can trust him. I'd rather try and fail than to never try. Fail forward. What you waiting on? Tomorrow's not promised. For some of you, God has some aptastic things right in your midst. Oh my gosh, what if I would allow my fear of stuttering to prevent me from going to Columbia, South Carolina in the fall of 1999? How many lives would not be impacted? I want you to feel the weight of this. Love God's glory more than your fear. Number two, how do we become courageous enough to face our fears? You have to learn to ignore cowards. You have to learn to ignore cowards. I love the Bible because it keeps it real. Check this out. 1 Samuel 17, 28. But when David's older brother, Elab, heard David talking to the men, he was angry. What are you doing around here anyway, he demanded. What about those few sheep you're supposed to be taking care of? I don't know. I know about your pride and deceit. You just want to see the battle. Okay, time out, time out. Let me get this right. Teenage David, probably about 17 at this time, shows up on the scene and is ready to fight the giant. He's ready to go into the middle of the valley, defend God's glory, defend Israel's honor, and his older brother, who should be out there fighting, is mad at him. Here's a Derwin Gray translation. Man, what is David doing here? Oh, oh gosh, he's gonna embarrass me. He's doing something that I should be doing, but I'm too afraid to do it. So I'm going to pull him down with me. David, who's taking care of those sheep? Dude, there is a giant about to eat your head. And you're worried about sheep? That's what cowards do. Is they attack you when you do the things that they only wished they had the courage to do. When I was a very young Christian, um, I would travel the country and I would speak, and when I would speak, the audiences were not very diverse. And I didn't understand that, because as I read the Bible, I seen the new heavens, new earth, every nation, tribe, and tongue. As I seen the Apostle Paul's ministry, Jew and Gentile, beautiful pictures of diversity in heaven, and I would travel and speak, and it didn't look like that. And so I began to ask pastors about it, and I just got horrible answers. And God basically said, don't criticize, create. So I began to uh, uh, tell other pastors, you know, I have a dream that I believe that heaven can be on earth, because Jesus said it. And I believe that there could be churches where black people and white people and Asian people, Latino people, and people who are black and white at the same time. And 
people who have mullets, like all kinds of people coming together, beautiful diversity and culture around the gospel, around Jesus, and pastors would go, yeah, that, you, that's a really good idea, but it's not gonna work. So don't even try it. I remember sitting around with church planners and them almost trying to run me out of the room except for they knew I would swell up on them and yeah, but I wouldn't do that because I love Jesus. But, but, but. And I remember, you can't do this. You can't plan a church like that. It's not possible. Well, on February 7, 2010, we did. And in our first year, we were the second fastest growing church in America. The next year, we're in the top 100. The next year, we're in the top 100. Now we've got campuses around the Charlotte area. We're getting ready to move into a new building. We've seen thousands of people come to faith. What if I would have listened? By the way, who are you listening to that's still in God's dreams in your life? Who's the Elibs in your life? You can't do that. For some of you in your 20s and teens, you're too young. <laughs> David was 17. Mary, the Virgin Mary, you heard of her? She brought Jesus into the world about 13, 14. You're not too young. What is God putting on your heart? What is that beautiful song in his symphony that he wants you to sing and you have that special note? You're not too young. And for those of you with gray hair, Transformation Church, I call that wisdom hair. For those of you with gray hair, you don't retire, you refire. You don't retire, you refire. Where does it say that when you get old, your job is just to golf or to shuffleboard? If you have breath in your lungs, the living God of the universe still wants to work through you powerfully. We need to hear your wisdom. We need to know who's gonna teach us if you don't. Maybe some of you are afraid, well, <laughs> I like what you said, preacher man, that was good, it got me going, but if I do something like that, I'll have to give up this stuff. Guys, in America, we've proven that we can get a lot of stuff. But have we proven that we can actually live? Stuff does not equate to life. Ignore cowards. How do we become courageous enough to face our fears? You gotta be you and not someone else. Be you and not someone else. Look at 1 Samuel 17, 38 through 40. Then Saul gave David his own armor, a bronze helmet, and a coat of mail. I don't know what a coat of mail is, but I bet it's pretty nice. I wonder if they sell that at Banana Republic. <laughs> David put it on, strapped the sword over it, and took a step or two to see what it was like, for he had never worn such things before. I can't go in these, he protested to Saul. I'm not used to them. So David took them off again. He picked up five smooth stones from a stream and put them into his shepherd's bag. Then armed only with his shepherd's staff and sling, he started across the valley to fight the Philistine. Do you see the imagery there? Saul is a king, Saul's been in battle, and he's like, hey David, here's my stuff. Why don't you wear it? It's worked for me, it'll work for you. Would you do the world a favor and be you? Because everybody else is already taken. Do the world a favor and be you. The world needs you or God wouldn't have made you. If God wanted me to be somebody else, I wouldn't be here. I would be them. Early in my preaching, and I'm still early in my preaching, I have no clue what I'm doing. But I studied preachers, and who better to study than Pastor Rick Warren? 
So I studied him and seen how he did his thing. And I'm like, I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna be like Pastor Rick. It didn't work. <laughs> Pastor Rick's a genius. I mean, he comes up with one-liners that I gotta study for six months. Like, I'm amazing. You know? But now I'm starting to realize God doesn't want me to be Pastor Rick. He wants me to be Derwin Gray. I cry, I yell, I scream, I get excited. You know why? Because that's who God's created me to be. Who's God created you to be? And you be fully who God's created you to be because God created you and said, you are mine. You have a note to sing in this symphony of life. Be you. And what gives us courage to do that is to know our identity in Christ. That because of our union life with Jesus, because we're in Jesus, all of that is true is about Jesus, is true about us, based on what he's done and not based on what we do. Can I talk to the ladies just for a moment? It's hard being a female in this culture. Um, you have to compete with airbrushed magazine covers. You, you, you do know they're airbrushed, right? <laughs> Why do you compare yourself to something that doesn't even exist? Um, I'm 43, I'm getting older, you know. I don't have 6% body fat anymore. My kids make fun of my love handles. <laughs> I'm 43. So ladies, you know, if you're 40 or older and you've had some kids, it's okay that you don't fit your jeans from high school anymore. <laughs> it's all right. It is. It's o it is okay. It's okay. God says you're beautiful. Have you listened to God's voice in Psalms 139, 13, and 14, that when you and your mother's womb, you are wonderfully and fearfully made? Have you looked in the mirror and said, I'm wonderfully and fearfully made because God says? Or have you looked at TV images? Have you looked at magazine covers and said, oh, I'm ugly because I don't look like them? And God is going, precious child, you are beautiful to me. Stop trying to be somebody else. Stop letting the culture define what's beautiful. And I know it's hard out here in Southern California. I wish they all would be kept. <laughs> and let me talk to you, since I'm here, since we're family, let me talk to the husbands. How are you gonna look after you have four kids? <laughs> where your hair go? Where, 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 where's it at? Where your abs at? <laughs> uh, my wife does not mind me sharing this, and this is just a part of our relationship. Is over the years, I've put my hands on her stretch marks, and I'll say, honey, you're beautiful. And I say, these stretch marks are a representation of your sacrifice and a picture of what you went through to bring our children into this world. And you are more beautiful to me than ever. My wife's had cancer. She's got a six inch scar on her neck. That's beautiful to me. She's more sexy and more attractive. And I love that woman. And I want her to know that no one on planet earth is as beautiful as she is. How about you husbands? Can I get a clap from the ladies? Okay. Y'all like that one, huh? <laughs> so how do we become courageous enough to face our fears? We, we trust the king. We, we trust the king. Let's watch this. <clears throat> David replied to the Philistine, as Goliath. You come to me with sword, spear, and javelin. So notice, all of those things are created. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies. 
Biblically, when it says in the name, that means in the character of, in the power of. So notice, Goliath comes to David with created things. David comes to Goliath to face the giant with an uncreated creator. Listen, we live in America, okay? Except for those of you who don't. We got a lot of stuff here. And I'm afraid that many of us don't really come in the name of the Lord. We come in the name of our checking account. We come in the name of our 401k. We come in the name of our cars. We come in the name of our abilities. We come in the name of whatever. And we can coast by in this country because we have so much. And God is longing for people. He's longing for me. He's longing for you to call upon his name to trust him, not intellectually, but to trust him where he grips our hearts, where he is more real to us than anything. Come in the name of the Lord, the God of the armies of Israel's whom you defied. Today, the Lord will conquer you. Wow. When was the last time you and I looked at something and said, Today, the Lord will conquer you. Today, God will heal my marriage. Today, God will touch the deepest and broken parts of my life. Today, the Lord will do it. We got a lot of stuff that we can depend upon. One of the greatest blessings that the Lord ever done for my wife and I is, is when she got diagnosed with cancer on May 17, 2004. I know right now you're like, did he just say one of the greatest things? Yeah. Now, at the moment, I wouldn't have said that. I wouldn't have said that at the moment, but now when I look back, because when you're diagnosed with cancer, you only have one person to go to, the Lord. And when you see that all you have is the Lord, you cannot live the same way again. So one of the greatest blessings that you and I can have is a great situation of adversity because in the midst of that adversity, you can't depend on your banking account, your 401k, and all of that stuff, and all of your skill, there's only one. Today, the Lord will conquer you. David just went off right here. I mean, can you imagine this 17-year-old dude? Okay, I'm gonna try to act like him. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to pull it off. I'm about to cut your dome piece off. You know, seriously, because, because the scripture goes on to say like David ran at him. So you imagine this 17-year-old red-headed Jewish dude going to battle with just a sling, and some rocks, running. Ah! I wonder if Goliath was like, ah! no, seriously, that would freak you out, wouldn't it? He was totally undermatched. I mean, if it was me, right, if it was me, I'm gonna go with some heavy artillery. David did go with heavy artillery, the Lord. And then I will give the dead bodies of your men to the birds and wild animals, and the whole world would know there is a God in Israel. As Goliath moved closer to attack, David quickly ran out to meet him. Hey, can I encourage you? In the name of the Lord, would you go a quickly run out and meet that fear? Go quickly. Can I share with you one of my go quickly moments, okay? I gotta write this book, 50,000 words, by November, I did the outline. I'm gonna run quickly towards it because if God called me to it, God will see me through it. I dropped my daughter off at college and for those of you with wisdom here, you're like, it's gonna be okay, son, it's gonna be okay. I'm like, Lord, did I, was I a good parent? Did I love her well? Lord, did I, did I give her everything she needs? Did, did we do it? You know, go quickly. 
Attack it. Reaching into his shepherd's bag and taking out a stone, he hurled it with his sling and hit the Philistine in the forehead. The stone sunk in and Goliath stumbled and fell face down on the ground. Let me pause here. I wonder what all of the great men of Israel were doing as a little teenage boy was doing their job. And I say this at Transformation Church too. I think sometimes what we do is we go, yeah, pastor, way to go. Yeah, good job, preacher. And God's like, no, you get in the ring. Come on, come on, I'm with you too. Come on. So David triumphed over the Philistine with only a sling and a stone, for he had no sword. I love that. I love that. God wants to make sure that we knew the only heavy artillery David had was himself, the Lord. Maybe right now you're thinking, you know, Pastor Derwin, I I, I, I feel what, what you're saying. I really do. But if I had this, I could. If I had this, I would. If I had this, I should. Don't live a woulda, coulda, shoulda life. You've got the Lord. You got everything you need right now in Jesus. Everything you need right now in him. I don't know what your giant is, but you have it. And then David ran over and pulled Goliath's sword from his sheath. David used it to kill him and cut off his head. How about that for a bedtime story? (laughs) Now, we need to be really, really careful right now, okay? And put this story in its redemptive historical context. In this story, I'm not David, and you're not David. In this story, David is a picture of the greater David, the greater and true king, Jesus. You see, Jesus is the true David who defeated the true Goliath. The true Goliath is sin, death, and evil. That's the true Goliath. That Goliath you and I cannot defeat. I know there's some incredibly gifted people watching from around the world this weekend, but you're not gifted enough to defeat Goliath. Here's a question. The word sin means to miss the mark. Well, what is the mark? If we want to know what God's intention, what God's purpose for humanity is, look no other than Jesus. Jesus was sinless. He is the blueprint of all that which God has created. And if we don't measure up to Jesus, we're called sinners. We're actually born sinners. Case in point, I've had little children. They've grown up. I pastor church, and we've got some beautiful little kids at Transformation Church, gorgeous kids. Like, I've seen three-year-olds, beautiful ones, walk up to another three-year-old, look at another three-year-old and go, he ya <laughs> Why? And then, who teaches kids to say, no, and mine? Where do they learn that from? Like, why do we have to teach kids to be selfless? Why do we have to teach them to share? Like, why wouldn't my kids just like, Father Derwin, (laughs) before we goeth to schooleth, would you pontificate from the Holy Scriptures? Read the book of Lamentations in Hebrew, please. (laughs) Father, you are oh so wise. Man, Christians set me up at the beginning, like, have a devotional with your kids. They were crazy in the morning. Our devotional was like, Presley, don't strangle your brother in Jesus' name. So the point is, we know deep down 
None of us measure up to Jesus. We're separated from a holy God who loves us. But Jesus defeated that giant called sin. How did he do it? He took our place on the cross. What motivated him? Love. Let me park there for a minute. What motivated the living God of the universe was love. There's never not been a time that Jesus has not loved you. There's never not been a time that Jesus has not thought about you. That moved him to Golgotha, the Jerusalem garbage dump, to down a cross to take our place. Jesus defeated death. Uh, my wife is cancer free. She, she's, she's cancer free and doing great. Yeah. Yeah. Doing wonderful. Now, if the Lord would have said, it's time for you to come home with me, he's still worthy of a clap. You know why? Because he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Though you die, you will, be, you will live. So what happened to Jesus will happen to all of his people. He defeated death. Now listen, this is deep here. I'm getting a doctorate to pontificate this knowledge. <laughs> one out of one people dies. <laughs> but we don't have to be afraid. Last time I seen my grandmother live and my grandmother raised me, she was my mom. She was statuesque when I was a little boy. She was about 5'9", strong, beautiful, athletic. Cancer ate her away. But when I see her again in the new heavens and new earth, no more cancer. Jesus defeated death. Matter of fact, when Jesus died, he got death in a headlock and said, shut up. In Jesus' resurrection, he also defeated evil. And you know, on days and weeks like we're experiencing, it doesn't seem like that when you have things that are happening in Iraq, the horror and tragedy of Ferguson, Missouri. When you see just so much evil and so much brokenness, it doesn't seem as though Jesus has defeated evil, but he has and you know how he defeats evil? He enlists you and I to help him. People go, where's God? And God is going, where are you at? Like, where are you at? You sitting on the sidelines. See, that's one thing that I love about Saddleback Church. That's why I love Pastor Rick. I mean, in Rwanda, I mean, the peace plan in Rwanda, are you kidding me? You guys have been to every country on the continent, are you kidding me? That's what I call a church. That's what I want Transformation Church to be about. It's not people who complain, when, when, the world is bad, but people who roll up their sleeves with Jesus and say, Spirit of God, fill me and empower me to be the change that I want to see in the world. Jesus is the true David who defeated the true Goliath. So here is our soul tattoo. Soul tattoo is kind of what, what, do we, what do we take home? What do we marinate on throughout the week? Here it is. Attack your fear by trusting Christ. That's gonna look very different and very unique in all of our lives. But in God's providence, that will be the case. And God doesn't want us to be paralyzed by fear. He wants that fear to move us to press into him so that he can fight our battles for his glory. That's about his story. I'm just about done. Um, I want to have a conversation with several of you around the Saddleback campuses. Uh, some of you listened, uh, you've been encouraged, you've, you've been challenged, and some of you are saying, you know what, um, I'm not sure I'm a follower of Jesus. Like, I'm not sure that I know him, I, I, I'm not sure that I've surrendered my life to him. I'm not sure that Jesus is my giant killer who's defeated sin, death, and evil. So I got a question. I started off by asking questions. I got a couple of questions. One, 
Have you surrendered your life to Jesus? Not just know about Jesus, not just attend church, but do you know him? Is he your savior? Is he your God? Is he your king? When you wake up in the morning, is he the heartbeat that makes you go? Do you live with shame and guilt? Jesus is the guilt and shame remover. Have you surrendered your life to him? Years ago, a teammate of mine with the Colts, his name was Steve Grant, his nickname was the Naked Preacher. Because every day after practice, he'd wrap a towel around his waist and he would preach. And before he would preach, he would say this, do you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus? So here's my question for you. Do you know Jesus? He wants you to know him. Would you pray with me? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the beautiful Saddleback community. Thank you for Pastor Rick and Kay and just their vision. Right now in this moment, if you've yet to surrender your life to Jesus, if you've yet to call him God and King, if you've yet to let him be your forgiver of sins, your power and inspiration for life, Today is the day, the moment is now, this weekend, right now. The Bible's very clear. It says if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. You will be rescued, saved from sin, death, and evil because Jesus defeated Goliath. If that's you and you're ready to receive him, in the silence of your heart, just say this to him. Lord Jesus, I receive you. You are the true David, the true king who's defeated my Goliath of sin, death, and evil. And by faith, I believe that on that rugged, bloody cross, you died for me. By faith, I believe that you rose again. And by faith, I believe that you live in me through the power of the Holy Spirit, that I am now a part of your eternal family. Thank you, Lord Jesus. In Christ's name, amen.